Um, computers. Um, so first of all, <laughs> I've been asked to talk about dark matter ax axions. This is a very specific axion. It's a QCD axion, and it's a QCD axion um, which is presumably the dark matter. So it's actually rather, as, as he said, it's a very specific band on the coupling. It, it relates the coupling and the mass quite specifically. Um, and this is a picture of the quad when it's in bloom, absolutely gorgeous. This is, if you want to get this one page and then go, you would probably get 90% of the talk. Um, this is the simplified talk. Basically, in the 1930s, this incredible tour de force at the time, there were nascent equipment that could measure velocities. There were essentially um, tables now of mass functions of galaxies, and they were crude. You put them together, and you realize that we have a dark matter problem in our galaxy. That was realized by some people in the 1930s. It was not generally accepted, but the word dark matter appeared. Uh, skipping quite a bit and oversimplifying, um, in the 1970s, spiral galaxy rotation curves were cataloged, and the dark matter problem was ubiquitous among all spiral galaxies. And to this day, there are no exceptions except for galaxies which are known to be stripped. So for instance, Sagittarius Dwarf, which is smeared, has a very poor mass to light ratio. It, nobody is surprised by that. Um, so the mass to light ratio is strongly weighted towards mass in spiral galaxies. This, I think, put the dark matter problem under everyone's nose. Meanwhile, primordial nucleosynthesis introduced a problem, and the conclusion of this problem was that dark matter is something exotic. It's not bowling balls or preprints. Um, <laughs> about the same time, the theory of the strong interaction came along, and a little bit bet later, people thought about instantons, which are, in the right way of looking at them, configurations of gluon fields viewed the right way. And um, they induce CP violation in the strong interactions. And on the way there, they solved several problems involving masses, et cetera, et cetera. People don't want to throw it away, but they were stuck with the CP violation. And of course, there's an industry of looking for strong interaction CP violation, and it's not seen. Meanwhile, there were these, quote, modern ideas of spontaneously broken symmetries. And you throw that into the mix, you posit some hidden symmetry, you posit it spontaneously broken, and there's a Goldstone boson. Um, it's called the axion. So that gave us QCD, it gave us the dark matter problem, it gave us axions. There were searches for axions. Bjork Kane was here, he was a spokesperson of one of the key searches that decoupled the scale of axion physics from the weak physics. So it was a key, um, it was a key search. Um, the conclusion from that is the axion exists, it's light, but as we saw, it can't be too light. And um, ergo, it's very hard to detect. It makes a neutrino look like a strongly interacting particle. Um, and then, it, of course, the axion, therefore, is an ideal dark matter candidate, given its production mechanism, given how weakly it interacts, given it has gravitational interactions, it's an ideal dark matter candidate. Um, in the 1990s, so people looked for these um, invisible axions, they were called, and they're invisible because they're impossible to see. In the 1990s, axion searches finally reached sensitivity to dark matter axions. I wouldn't say they reached them in a production way because these were extremely difficult experiments, but that was a milestone in axion research to finally reach sensitivity in the mass range of interest. Mass range of interest means masses that would give you the right density today with the right coupling. That was in the 1990. By the year 
new, by the new century, axions are embedded, in fact, in a richer landscape. Always were, but it came to our attention. They're embedded in a richer landscape. Axions uh, from cosmology and particle physics, basically, we're in an explosion of <laughs> activity, both experimentally and theor theoretically. Um, it has really been exploding, so I don't know. It's an inflationary scenario. scenario. Um, there was this book, which I shouldn't say book, a study, which was T, I think. It was, I guess by now it's a decade old, maybe eight years old. It's key. It was an NRC study, Quarks to Cosmos. It identified several key problems and several paths forward. Some of the key problems infecting cosmology are inflation, the nature of particle dark matter and dark energy, what drove the Big Bang, what is the dark matter particle, what's the dark energy. And you see some of the players in addressing these, Alan Guth, Saul, and Lord Rees of Ludlow. Um, so it's a crucial problem, and that actually put wind behind the sails of this in some sense, that study. It really brought things together. Um, let me talk about the origins of the dark matter problem. You could start with the wind, because people thought in Greek times the wind was a dark matter, but maybe not. I'll start with Oort. Oort was one of these guys who was using these nascent observational tools of Doppler spectroscopy. And he looked at certain classes of stars in our neighborhood, and he knew crudely that our galaxy crudely was a disk. And he knew crudely, therefore, how those nearby stars should move in and out of the disk. So you can probe the potential and ask, gee, do you see a disk potential? And Oort was troubled when he looked at the motions of stars out of our disk in 1932-ish that he didn't see a disk potential. It looked like they're moving kind of in a uniform mass. This was kind of troubling. So he said in this paper, there's a serious discrepancy between the observed material and dynamically estimated mass. And he flat out used the term dark matter for this mass, mass that was unseen. Of course, most people start here because there's some great pictures of, Zw of Zwicky. Um, Zwicky and Smith looked at clusters of galaxies, two examples of clusters and galaxies. And notice that the bees represented by the galaxies were buzzing around way too fast for the mass of the bees. So he concluded that the virial velocities were way too big and, in fact, well beyond a, quote, escape velocity inferred from the masses. Remember, they had tables of mass functions. So they, even with the errors in the tables, they knew there was a problem. And uh, he flat out, this is Zwicky here, he flat out said that this is good data, good observations, and the issue is unex unexplained. There are other things. Hubble chimed in on this, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the early dark matter problem in the 1930s. I don't think people were greatly troubled. However, by 1970s, before 1970s, but by the 1970s, there were many rotation curves studied. And Keplerian type rotation curves would give you this sort of behavior. In other words, once you're beyond the mass, you can <laughs> see it fall off. This is what you observe. Now, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down, sometimes they flat, sometimes they aren't. No, none of them are Keplerian for spiral. There are a few ellipticals that one could argue about out of the many, but in no case do you have any that are Keplerian? Our own galaxy is poorly measured. Here we are, a few kiloparsecs out, and we live in a more or less flat rotation curve. Uh, that was really a tour de force, I think. And I don't know how many are well measured now. There's probably 1,000, 2,000 of these spiral galaxies that are well, well measured. Um, by now, this is part of the explosion of dark matter. This is Tom Quinn. This is Aquarius type survey. This is end body simulation. Okay, end body simulation requires dark matter for there to be agreement between structure that you see. Okay, and 
the simulations. There are details at the edges, gas, not gas, blah, 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 but you have to have dark matter. Strong lensing. So this is a rich cluster of galaxies, and you see it being lensed. I just said that exactly wrong. You see distant objects being lensed by it. Rich cluster of galaxies. With certain assumptions, you can make a map a potential map of this rich cluster, and you find there is tremendous amounts of mass in this object. So you're not using dynamics anymore, you're using bending of light. Um, Hubble suggested this a long time ago. When people were looking at the bending of starlight on the limb of the sun, he said, man, this is great. You could weigh things, not just the sun, but other things. Um, this is, of course, a rich cluster, and you can see individual dots which represent galaxies, but the bulk of the mass is in some uniformly distributed stuff. Um, this is just part of the explosion, and this is something everybody's seen. This is something that is great to be alive now because this is the energy mass of the universe on the biggest scale, and one of the big problems is the identity of dark matter, which is a quarter or so of the budget. Um, that guy looks familiar. It's got to be exotic. This is an old plot. It's a little overly optimistic. Um, but this basically says that, believe it or not, you can understand the light isotope abundance left over from the Big Bang. And that light isotope abundance depends on the number of baryons in the early universe puts a limit on the number of baryons. So if you increase the number of baryons, you increase the number of projectiles that break up deuterium, and mainly there's other stuff going on. So by measuring the deuterium abundance, you can make some statement about the number of baryons in the early universe. Dark matter must be exotic. Is dark matter made of neutrinos? Nope. Structure, this is stuff I'm not going to focus on. Then Frank Wilczek in Physics Today, he doesn't realize this, he wrote this column, but it had enormous impact because he starkly said that there are only a couple candidates that we know, doesn't say there can't be others, there could be unknown unknowns. But among the known unknown, there's WIMPs and there's axions. So um, that was a very powerful column, whether he recognized it or not. Uh, let me make a slight digression since this is an axion workshop. And I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. Is there a way to tell? We know, we know the dark matter is cold. We know it's an exotic species left over from the Big Bang. We know, actually, it's baryonic. Oh, it's baryonic. We know it's bosonic. Do we know anything else about it? Could it be axionic? Well, maybe we could tell if it's axionic. For one thing, wimps haven't been found. Maybe. <laughs> Wimps haven't been found. Some people are surprised by this. Um, there are these detectors. Xenon 100 is 100 kilograms of xenon. It's sniffing at some number of zeptobarn cross-section. That zeptobarns of cross-section is orders of magnitude smaller than the weak interaction cross-section. The Wimp miracle, remember, was predicated on the magic of weak interaction cross-section plus 100 GV plus freeze-out gives you the right number of amount of dark matter today. We're orders of magnitude below that weak interaction cross-section. Now, Howie could explain why, but I'm a little bothered. I, I, I don't mind a factor of 10, but factors of 1,000 and more get me nervous. WIMPs have not been found in very powerful detectors, and certainly LHC hasn't found SUSY, let alone the lightest supersymmetric partner. And frankly, since Frank tells us it's axions and WIMPs, if I derate WIMPs, I, relatively speaking, increase axions. That's not a very good argument, but I <laughs> had to say it. However, Howie's told us in the discussion that even in a SUSY universe, Axions are actually a sensible dark matter candidate. That's more relevant. In other words, rip axions out of cosmology, run SUSY, look at, look at the particle spectrum, et cetera, et cetera, 
look at big bang nucleosynthesis, then throw in axions, and you find axions are better. They're more comfortable. Um, mainly axion, cold dark matter, and M. sucra. Is conventional wisdom wrong? Conventional wisdom says there's absolutely no way to tell beyond some very, very short length scale WIMP dark matter structure from axion dark matter structure. Is this wisdom wrong? Could you observe a difference between axionic and WIMP dark matter? And the answer is certainly maybe or no. Okay. In the certainly department, axions and WIMPs have different freeze out times. They have different velocity dispersions. You can conceive of experiments, for instance, where you lens off a structure which is a dark matter structure. The width of that structure, the smearing of that structure is different if you have WIMPs and if you have axions. Axions are incredibly sharp. They are so sharp, their, their velocity dispersion when they're cold is so incredibly tiny you will never be able to measure it. It's not quite the case for WIMPs. Okay? Um, so the answer is certainly, and it's barely at the fringes of being resolvable in some cockamamie scenario. Um, perhaps Pierre has argued that there is, well, Pierre hasn't argued this. Other people have argued this. There's a lithium-7 problem. There's not enough lith lithium-7. And it's a significant deficit. Um, maybe the models are wrong. Maybe the observations are wrong. In fact, I really question some of these observations. But maybe there's some new process between the end of Big Bang nucleosynthesis and decoupling that cools photons. If you manage to do that, you can solve this lithium-7 problem. Uh, Pierre will explain how axions do this. Uh, finally, there are structures in our galaxy, there are structures in other galaxies. An example of a structure is there is something in our galaxy called the Monoceros ring. It is a ring, it's in the plane of our galaxy, and it's an excess of baryonic matter, stars, in a ring around our galaxy. It's probably nothing, it's probably gastrophysics, or God only knows. However. Pierre argues that the infall of Bose-Einstein dark matter, that is to say axions, is very different than the infall of WIMP dark matter. And the difference is like that of taking helium above the superfluid transition, normal helium, and stirring it. You certainly get structures in the helium liquid when you stir it. However, put the liquid below the superfluid point, and you get some very distinctive stru structures. You can tell by looking at the liquid whether you're stirring a Bose condensate or not. We will hear more about that. Um, so the answer is yes, maybe, and no, or no, maybe, and yes. Can you tell the difference? Let me get back to this. QCD. QCD conserves the symmetry CP. This is actually surprising to me. So when QCD was introduced, God, I almost feel embarrassed to do this in front of you. So I'll look at it. When QCD was introduced, it, it certainly respected the symmetries PCP, et cetera, okay? In 1975, at least a paper was published. That's Polyakov's paper. And Polyakov said, look, there are objects, if you look at the right space-time, called instantons or pseudoparticles. They're, part, they're called pseudoparticles because they're particle-like. Carry energy, they annihilate, they transport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pseudoparticle solutions of the Yang-Mills equation. What these particles, what these things are, are they are objects, and they are, since they have to do with gluon fields, they're kind of the QCD size, okay? They carry some charge of some kind, quantized charge. I won't tell you what. So the reds are one sign of the charge, the blues the other. They could annihilate with each other. 
They're called instantons because they appear in this funny time coordinate. They appear and they disappear. That was why they picked up the name instanton. The more interesting thing is when you integrate the fields in this object, it carries CP. So if you were to integrate E color dot B color over this object, you would get none zero. Okay? It carries CP. If it winks in and out, you've got CP violation. In fact, you have a lot of CP violation due to, the, due to this. One solution to this, of course, is throw this away because it's rubbish. But it solves this irksome problem having to do with light meson masses, among other things. This is very odd. So are the light meson masses, our understanding of them, then an accident? That seems rather implausible. Um, so yeah, there's CP violation. Of course, there's a whole industry of looking for CP violation in neutrons, in atoms. Anything that doesn't have a degenerate ground state is good for, and you can spin it, is good for doing this experiment. It's not been found. It leads to the strong CP problem. Where did the CP violation go? That brings us to two postdocs. I think they were postdocs or assistant professors at SLAC, Roberto Peche and Helen Quinn. And they basically said, look, these are modern times. Let's posit a new symmetry. It's an axial symmetry. It's broken. It has to be broken because it's not obvious there's the partner, say, of the proton lying around with the opposite parity. So by gully, it has to be broken. And so broken continuous hidden symmetry, Goldstone boson, the miracle of that is the extra terms you get when you all took particle physics and studied the Higgs process. Invoking the Higgs with its VEV gave you a whole bunch of new terms and interactions. Those new terms and interactions nulled the CP violation and the strong interaction. That was called the Peche Quinn mechanism. Um, I don't know of a better explanation of why there's no strong CP violation and the strong interaction. Here's the property of the axion. You've seen it. Its mass is inversely proportional to the symmetry breaking scale, the decay cons constant. All couplings, of course, are inversely proportional to the decay constant. Uh, there's a magic coupling we'll talk about later of axion into two photons. This is what we picked up in the early parts of the talk. If the axion were too light, there'd be way too much matter, dark matter in the universe. Um, if it's too heavy, because the couplings uh, obey this, if it were too heavy, you'd have a new pion eventually. That wasn't seen. So you get a window of something like, and this is, remember, QCD, dark matter axion, between a micro EV and a milli EV, with some fuzz at the edges, of course, where you want to look for dark matter axions. I wanted to talk about the special role of the axion to two photon coupling. You can imagine lots of ways you could make axions or have axions interact. One way is you could brem the axion off. Photon could come in, boom, you brem an axion off. Another thing is you can imagine it looks like a pion. There's an anomaly, two photons. If I were to write, and in both cases, there's an effective coupling constant. Here it's GAEE -E because EE. -E. Here it's GA gamma gamma because gamma gamma. So two effective coupling constants. This is really ugly. This is from Colbin Turner's book. This is the expression for the axion brem off an electron. That's the effective coupling constant. What you notice is there's this thing, X sub E, that is the charge that you assign, the new U1 charge, I should say, that you assign to the electron in this PQ symmetry. What in the world do you pick for that? There's an infinite manifold of possible things that you can pick. The bottom line is it's highly model dependent. On the other hand, axion of two photons is pions. Okay, When you look at that effective coupling constant, it contains to leading order 
the electromagnetic anomaly of this symmetry divided by the color anomaly of the new symmetry. It means that, yeah, I should have put charges here, but they cancel in that ratio. The Peche Quinn charges that you put in, these U1 charges cancel for leading order in the ratio. And you're left with something that contains mass and uh, that little anomaly is there. But What's capital N? Pardon? What's capital N? That is the major piece of the color anomaly of this PQ symmetry. And this is the major piece of the electromagnetic anomaly of the PQ symmetry. And this, contain, this is a shorthand for something containing lots of masses. And this is the symmetry breaking scale in alpha. Um, so let me back up for a second. There are, I'm, I'm trying to reinterpret your, your question in my language. There's a class of experiment, which is a laser experiment. You apply a transverse B field, for instance, and you shoot a laser through it. At that vertex, where the photon comes out, by gully, axion, right? Brem, not Brem, scatters off a static photon and out comes a, another photon. That particular experiment would have this as the effect of coupling. It's a good coupling. There are astrophysical searches, for instance, which would look for this. And we have them on our canonical plots. We have taken the liberty of converting them to this. We probably did it, did it wrong, but we had to do something for goodness sake. The point of this is I wanted to point out that wow, there's a lot of model dependence, but not much. The only real model dependence for this process is the decay constant for that process. Um, this is just restating there's an axion search window. And recap the axions in dark matter. Boy, we've already beat this into the ground. Dark has no interactions to speak of except for gravity, okay? Matter, gravity interactions, bosonic, et cetera. Um, let me make a couple points here because we're poking people in the eye from the WIMP detectors. Um, they don't have no clue what their mass range is. The mass for dark matter axions is constrained to one or two orders of magnitude. Kind of, yeah. And the axion coupling, pardon? You certainly have heard bigger ranges here to here to here today. But for QCD dark matter axions, if the axion is much lighter than 10 microelectron volt, it would badly overclose the universe. If it were much heavier than 10 microelectron volt, there wouldn't be enough of it to be the dark matter, among other things. There are other, once you decouple the, w once you separate the mass and the coupling, anything is possible. Um, so the couplings as well are constrained to about an order of magnitude. This is for the axion of two photon, and I was going to put in a plug for dark matter axions. This is the canonical plot that we've seen. This is the putative axion mass. This is the coupling constant of axion to two photon. Um, you can see the incredible sensitivity of the experiments. They're down in the dark matter axion range, which is sort of here. They're down to uh, 10 to the minus 15 in inverse a GV. There are a bunch of other experiments. Horizontal branch bounds are the placeholder for lots of astrophysics. Solar, laser, even Michael Turner looked for optical flashes and clusters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me get back to this two-photon coupling. Um, I wanted to make two points. When I said it was weakly coupled, it is really weakly coupled. Uh, Micro-EV axion scale lives around 10 to the 50th years. 
Okay. On the other hand, that's the bad news. The good news is the local dark matter density in this room, for instance, is enormous. There's something like 10 to the 14th of them per cc. So you win some, you lose some. Okay. Um, here's how the experiment works. And again, I've got to invoke Pierre Zekivi's uh, uh, mind here. Axion to two photon with effective coupling constant. Just classically, if I wanted to inject a pseudoscalar field classically, this is Jackson's Maxwell's equations for that field. I just inject it here. And once you have these two Maxwell's equations, there, you can imagine a whole host of experiments that would give you some hint of whether that pseudoscalar field is around. Uh, the experiment that we're going to do is impose a strong external magnetic field B, and we will find that energy gets transferred from the axion field into the electric field. That's the experiment that we are going And this is getting more <laughs> to the point on the experiment. There are magnets here. So here's a magnet coil, and the magnet field is vertical. Here's a nearby axion. Scatter off a photon. Out comes a real photon. And except for a tiny correction that is so ridiculously tiny, I don't even want to think about it, the outgoing photon mass is equal to the total axion energy. OK? Um, a signal would sort of look like this. There's some uncertainty of what it looks like. If the dispersion in velocity of the local axions is 10 to the minus 3, then the energy dispersion would be something like 10 to the minus 6. They're non-relativistic. Um, maybe it's less than that. But anyway, that's sort of what we're shooting for. There are a couple things to keep in mind. One is the time it takes you to scan some frequency range as a 1 over noise temperature squared. This will feed into John Clark, how we can make money on that term. But basically, keep in mind that if we make improvements in the noise temperature, the figure of merit for this search improves quadratically. Okay. Um, this is now a particular implementation of these experiments. Of, uh, this is the ADMX experiment. It's the largest uh, QCD dark matter axion search. Um, this is a cartoon of it. Just to give you a scale of it, it's four meters tall. It's got eight Tesla magnet. It's many tons, microwave cavities. Clark can tell you. John Clark will tell us about the amplification here um, and the systems that have to be around it to allow it to operate. It's really an engineering tour to force, and I would have to credit, there's a fellow named uh, Wolfgang, Sch Wolfgang Stoffel, who conceptualized, every experiment should have a Bavarian, is, is my advice. <laughs> so our Bavarian was Wolfgang Stoffel, and he's tremendous. This is the magnet being ramped up during a test. So this gives you an idea. The magnet, of course, goes way up there. There's a couple things to point out here. One is these are the magnet leads. And notice they're being yanked apart. There's tremendous currents going through the magnet. Secondly, you'll notice, if you look carefully, there are wrenches here which follow the field line. So we are mapping the field with wrenches. If you let a wrench go across the room, it will crack your skull open. And you'll also notice that magnetic fields make you lose your hair, which is a very <laughs> unpleasant thing I discovered. Yes. And there's what the cavity looks like. It's a copper cavity. Um, it's robust because it's copper. The Yale people are arguing that there are ways, even though it's tricky, to make superconductivity work in this context. Dave Tanner can explain this. Um, but we are using copper. These are tuning rods. They're the size of baseball bats. This is the insert being pulled out of the bore. It's still steaming from its cryo life. Um, this is a tower on top of the experiment with just valves, plumbing, etc. This is um, Andrew Wagner uh, with his quantum electronics. He's working on it. Um, John Clark, to be honest, has gotten us all very excited about uh, quantum electronics. So 
we are all out in the microfab lab trying to get smart on quantum electronics. It's, that piece is fascinating. The receiver is an AM radio. I won't tell you how an AM radio works, except if you were a radio engineer and I told you it was a double heterodyne receiver, this is what it is. And basically, we look at the power spectrum of electromagnetic radiation within the cavity, and we want to see a Maxwellian with that kind of shape. That would be ideal. Um, along the way, we have the world's lowest noise radio receiver. Um, if you integrate for a very long time, in this case a month, you eventually reach the uh, systematic limit of this experiment. And that's something like 10 to the minus 3 of the most pessimistic coupling. Of course, we don't integrate for a month on a given setting, but we could if we wanted to. And that's about a hundredth of a yoctawatt. We're now about a thousandth of a yoctawatt. And if technology works the way we think it does, we need a new prefix. Um, this is how we tune the cavity. It doesn't seem to want to work. But let's see if it works. No. Oh, you can see the rods are moving. So we just move, translate the rods around. And the frequency change, changes. There's a pretty picture of it doing nothing. Anyway, moving right along. Let me do that again. This is, I can tell you this, when you move the tuning rods within the cavity, the frequency changes within the cavity. That was the point of that. Um, this is just some sample data. Here's a sweep of about 40 kilohertz in the cavity, and you don't see an axion there. If you add them up, in this case, you see a statistical peak that wasn't there when we sat on it. Remember, we can sit for a month. We sat on this for an hour, and it didn't reappear. Um, I won't talk about microwave amp amplification because we have other talks. Um, here, here. But let me just say our experiment makes use of them. This is an amplifier containing a squid. It sits in the middle of an experiment inside exquisite engineering to make the thing work. Um, this is just some of the things you need to have to make the squid happy. You need incredible magnetic shielding when you're in an eight Tesla field, and you're sensitive to much less than a quantum of flux. You just have to trust me on that. Um, this is a 100 yoctawatt approximate calibration peak. It almost saturates our dynamic range. That would be a big signal for us, 100 yoctawatt. Um, this tells us that we like the WIMP people, need to understand the halo. We are now worried, and we worry now about what is the halo model we ought to use. If we pick two different halo models, we change the significance of these peaks. So we are keenly interested in what theorists have to say and the end body people have to say about what is the likely halo that we should use. You've seen this. This is six months with a squid, and this was 10 years with transistor amplifiers, and we aim to do better. I wanted to make one final point, and that is these experiments that are sensitive to axions are also sensitive to other exotic, weakly interacting particles. One of them is chameleons. So chameleon is something whose mass depends on local, I would say, T squared with energy. I won't tell you how those experiments work, but they go along for the ride. Hidden sector photons go along for the ride because we have a parasitic cavity outside the experiment. We co-tune it with the main experiment, and if there were hidden sector photons, the photons would jump from one cavity to the other, we'd see a line. They go along for the ride with these classes of experiments. How do you detect Pardon? Do you have a source for the or do you detect uh, Gray will explain it, but basically we dump power into the cavity and some of those photons turn into chameleons and are then trapped within the steel confines of the cavity walls. They can't escape. 
until they reconvert. So what's happening to ADMEX now? We're building the final phase. Essentially, we're adding a dilution refrigerator. This is another view of this canonical plot. Here's the axion mass. Oh, I'm out of time. Here's the coupling. Here's what we've published. This is what we like to do in a year. Uh, we have colleagues at Yale who are working on the higher frequency end and working on R&D, and they're pushing that phase of it. And it's clearly within the axion dark matter range now, these, ex these, these experiments. This is just a smorgasbord of how do you do better. It's a dog's lunch of things, and probably I'm missing the key thing. Higher frequency cavities coupling very high frequencies into, into squids, making high frequency squid amplifiers. Single microwave photon detection. Exotic superconducting films to raise the cavity Q. Variants of devices containing Josephson junctions, this case Josephson parametric amplifiers. These things are going to make us do better. Um, let me just skip this. It's just an advertisement on how much better. Let's just say a lot better. And let me get to the end. So are we going to find the QCD dark matter axion? The answer is sure. I have little doubt of it. Okay? Um, and let me give you some commentary. I personally find the strong CP problem very troubling. Many theorists don't. I'm really surprised by that. The source of CP violation in the weak interactions should as well induce strong C interaction CP violation. That's just the way it goes. As Ann Nelson says, I believe the math. Okay? This isn't seen. It's not a one order of magnitude. It's lots of order of magnitude discrepancy. So there's an issue there. CP is missing in the strong inter interactions. And QCD axions are a good bet for the strong CP problem. The same axions happen to solve the dark matter problem. And because it has the two photon coupling, and we're not too sensitive on the halo structure, the particle physics predictions, the math, is sufficiently robust, as are the halo models. As Michael Turner said long ago, if you made axions, how would you keep them out? Even if you cobbled up a way ab initio to do it, how would you do it later? The halo models are good enough in some sense. There are many axion search technologies. The RF cavity technique is the only one sensitive to these QCD dark matter axions. These are these particular style. The coming ADMX phases will be sensitive to even the more pessimistically coupled ones. There is a lower limit to the coupling of axion into two photons. Remember, the axion decays through an anomaly into two photons. You cannot screw up that anomaly. And this is one of the robust predictions of field theory, of, of string theory. It has to agree with low energy particle physics anomaly structure. If it doesn't, it's throw it away. So in order to agree with low energy particle physics anomaly structure, there's a lower bound to the axion coupling. Um, so um, that's what I mean by even the most pessimistically coupled QCD dark matter axions. And quite starkly, these experiments will soon have the sensitivity and mass to either detect them, these are these particular beasts, or rule them out. It's one of the rare dark matter searches that can do it whichever way the coin turns up. Anyway, thanks. Gray, do you want to moderate this? So, this was a great overview of the talk, but I'm leery about. <laughs> okay. I'm leery about the uh, dark matter bound that somebody else mentioned. I mean, there's at least three ways to get around that bound. Uh, you, know, you can have a lower misalignment angle, or in some context, uh, the axino and the sac. Both their, their coupling is suppressed, they naturally inject entropy, which violates the uh, calculation of the standard axion abundance. And 
And then in string theory, if you've got moduli in the 10 keV regime, they also could dilute the axions. And so you actually have three mechanisms, plausibly, that could all be operating at the same time. You're undoubtedly right, because I'm a poor experimenter. But I'm worried that it focuses people's thinking that you should be looking towards smaller FAs, and you've got this lower bound on FA, or upper bound on FA, and you should be, you know, in theory, you should be going the other way. You're undoubtedly correct. I mean, I can't argue with anything you've said. I have a small story to tell you, though. The story to tell you is Witten put out a paper, and I forget with who now, two summers ago, called Axions in String Theory. And my skin depth on that paper was about half a page. And I skipped, I said, okay, fine, I'll skip to the very end. The last page had prediction of the coupling of the axion. And I looked at the coupling of the axion, and I went through his calculation and said, wow, that's only a quarter of the gut axion. By gut axion, I mean the ratio of the anomalies is three-eighths, the unrenormalized sine squared theta W. That's what I mean by a gut axion. I went, wow, it's within a quarter of that. In fact, it's exactly a quarter of that. I said, that's amazing. Witten came to visit, and I said, you know, you're going to have to explain to me how is it that it should be a quarter of this gut axion, three-eighths. He said it should be exactly the gut axion because, of course, it has to agree with the anomaly structure of the low energy theory. So he went back and recomputed and picked up the factor four. So I found an error <laughs> in a Witten paper. <laughs> but you are correct, <laughs> undoubtedly. Anyway, thank you.